Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. <laughs> okay, so today I'm going to give a brief overview of the Carbon okay. Collectible okay. NFTs program. By the way, can Carbon. everybody see my screen? By the way, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. And so I will give an overview of the presentation. Then we're going to interview Franklin Assaye from the Ho Institute of Technology. He's going to talk about the educational system in the Avatime area and the surrounding area. So first of all, um, carbon collectible NFTs, the world's first non-fungible digital carbon offset. And so in this overview, I'm going to explain exactly what that means. So first of all, we humans, we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out carbon dioxide. When we drive cars um, that use gasoline, that's generating carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. When you fly in an aeroplane, um, we've all got a carbon footprint. And what we're doing is we're generating greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, which most scientists believe is the main cause for um, for global warming. What trees do is they do almost exactly the opposite. Um, they have this interaction between sunlight and water and chlorophyll that actually converts carbon dioxide into carbon, which becomes the wood in the trunk of trees, and then they emit oxygen. And so trees and forests are really good at reversing this process. And they're actually um, our best carbon sink right now. Unfortunately, there's a lot of deforestation going on around the world that is reducing the effectiveness of this. And so what we're trying to do is to help the fight against global warming, we're actually disrupting the, the traditional carbon offset industry by using NFTs to raise funding, then redirect some of that funding to some forestry communi communities around the world. And in particular, our NFT is fairly unique. It's a mixed reality avatar. So when you mint our NFT, you can actually, it's actually a humanoid with an animal's head and you can select, you know, do you want the animal's head to be an elephant's head or a lion's head or some other animal? You can select the different colors of the body, the clothing, et cetera. And so you can actually customize your avatar. And then after you mint the NFT, you can actually connect to a website and then you can navigate that avatar through a metaverse forest. And in navigating through that forest, the goal is to transport crypto funding to real world, low income forestry communities to offset your real world personal carbon footprint for 10 years into the future. So the question is, why are we doing this? What problem are we solving? And that's what we want to answer today. So to answer that question, I just want to give you a brief primer on carbon offsets. And so in California, we have what's called a cap and trade program, where the state of California regulates the emissions of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So they say to the electricity company, you're only allowed to emit a certain amount of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. If you exceed your limit, we're going to fine you. Alternatively, you can buy carbon offsets from a, another organization who is either removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere or they're avoiding the emission of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And so a carbon credit, and people use the term carbon credit and carbon offset interchangeably, but a carbon credit is an allowance, in this case, for the electricity company to emit greenhouse gases a carbon offset is the removal. And so, for example, um, if you look at Tesla, last year Tesla made more money from selling carbon offsets than they did from selling cars. So you can argue that Tesla is actually a carbon offset company, not a car company. Now, there's two different types of carbon offsets. There's compliance carbon offsets and voluntary carbon offsets. Under a cap and trade program like we have in California, and there's multiple cap and trade programs in Europe as well, those companies that are regulated by a government entity, they can only buy their carbon offsets from a regulated exchange. 
So they cannot buy our carbon offsets because we are not operating under a regulated program. Those are compliance carbon offsets. At the same time, there's organizations like Toyota, Amazon, and other organizations like that who are not mandated to offset their carbon emissions, but they just volunteer. And they say, look, we're good corporate citizens. We're volunteering to be carbon neutral. And so they can actually buy voluntary carbon offsets from anybody. Anybody can buy and sell voluntary carbon offsets. And so our carbon offsets will be classified as voluntary carbon offsets. Now, the problem or one problem with these traditional compliance and voluntary carbon offsets is that there are these third party certification organizations who are there to kind of prevent fraud. The problem is that their, real, their certification process is really expensive. It can easily cost $150,000, $700,000, some are, are more than a million dollars. These low income forestry communities cannot afford that. And so this becomes exclusionary. And so moving on, so traditional carbon offsets, their goal is to incentivize new carbon sequestration not to reward existing carbon sequestration. So they exclude mature forests, like the mature forests in Avatimi, because the carbon sequestration there is not additional. They regard it as being business as usual. And again, for traditional carbon offsets, um, again, they're exclusionary and they're not equal because they have these high, high, very high certification costs which ends up filtering out a lot of low-income forestry communities. Conversely, our digital carbon offsets, our goal is entirely different. It's equity and inclusion in climate finance. And inclusion in this case means that we include mature forests like the um, forests in um, the Abatime community. In terms of equity, our cost of certification is zero dollars. Anybody can afford zero dollars. And so this is providing equal access to climate finance. And so how can we do that? We do that by using new modern technologies. And particularly, we use satellite imagery to, uh, again, can, can we use satellite technology to monitor the tree cover and machine learning and artificial intelligence to, to use that satellite imagery to estimate the carbon sequestration of these forests. And it's actually a third party organization that does this and we use their technology. We also use a blockchain to eliminate double counting so that if somebody is selling carbon sequestration, they can't sell the same carbon sequestration twice. We also use a broker dealer who will verify the right of sale. Does this forest really exist? Do the promoters of the forest have right the right to um, to monetize that carbon sequestration. Is the government aware of this? In, in this case, the Forestry Commission, do they support this program? And so broker dealers are actually, um, they're registered by in the US by the SEC and FINRA. And so um, these are trusted third parties who in this case, verify the right of sale on, on behalf of this program. And in terms of the right, so when you buy a carbon collectible NFT, you get the rights, the digital and virtual rights to one hectare of land. You do not get the physical rights to the trees or the land itself. The and so, uh, again, when you buy one of these NFTs, you get the digital and virtual rights to one hectare of forestry but we do not convey any of, the, any of the physical rights to the trees or the land. And the price of each NFT is $500. That's $10 per carbon, voluntary carbon offset. There's five carbon offsets per hectare. And it's for a 10 year term into the future, rather than being a historical carbon offset, like a traditional program. And of that price, approximately 65% will be reinvested into different community programs. And those programs will include forest management activities that are designed to optimize the health 
of the forest. Also, forest security, um, which is designed to prevent or deter illegal logging and, and man-based or man-initiated bushfires. And um, the majority actually goes into a social innovation studio. And this is like a startup accelerator. The purpose here is to get suggestions from the community in terms of challenges that the community is facing and ways to address those challenges. And then what we will do is share that information um, with crypto based, um, our crypto based community who will look at those problems in a very different way and figure out whether the blockchain, DAOs, stable coins, DeFi can reimagine completely different solutions for those age old problems. And so, and then eventually figure out a business solution to those problems using these new innovations. And then that's gonna spur innovation, entrepreneurship, create new jobs, and hopefully um, spur economic growth in that local community. And so just to summarize the problem solution fit. And so in this case, traditional carbon offsets are the problem. They're not the solution. And the reason they're a problem is because they're exclusive and they're unaffordable to certain forestry communities. Our solution, conversely, is to create a whole new class of digital carbon offsets to disrupt the traditional carbon offset industry. And then to summarize our product market fit, we are selling mixed reality NFTs that convey digital and virtual rights to one hectare of forestry. And this includes in real world carbon sequestration. And we're targeting the, the socially conscious crypto community. And again, to just to summarize our advantages. So our carbon offsets are inclusive. They're equitable in that the certification cost is $0 and we eliminate intermediaries. They're non-fungible because we link to unique hectares of forestry and they convey, convey rights into the future, whereas traditional carbon offsets are completely historical. And so before we get on to questions, what I'm actually going to do is interview um, Franklin and say, and in fact, before I do that, I actually have an appendix here, which is really keening on some, some mega trends. And so if you look at what Web 1.0, this happened in the past, and so the initial version of the internet was really email and one-way centralized information like bulletin boards. And then we eventually got to web 2.0, which is the present. And that's point, point decentralized information exchanges. So anybody can now create and receive information. Unfortunately, the value is centralized in these big organizations like Facebook. So you don't own your own information. They are monetizing your information. And the way that manifests itself in the real world is that if you buy a cup of coffee, less than 1% of the price of the cup of coffee goes to the farmer who is actually farming the cocoa. And if you think about this, Ghana and the Ivory Coast, they control 70% of the supply of cocoa, but they're getting less than 1% of the value when coffee is being sold, chocolate, et cetera. And so there's something wrong with that picture. If you look at Web 3.0, me, this is a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized value exchange. And so the supplier, in this case, a farmer, can put their hectare of land up for sale, in this case, sell of the carbon sequestration, a buyer from anywhere around the world who wants to offset their carbon footprint they can pay money, which goes almost directly to that farmer for the, those carbon sequestration rates. And in the future, as this industry matures and as Web 3.0 matures, the farmer or that supplier can end up getting 60 or up to 85% of the value of the goods and services that they're selling. This is the promise of Web 3.0, and this is the direction that we're heading in, in terms of peer-to-peer peer decentralized value exchanges. And these are just some of the images from the visit that we had recently to the Abatime Forest. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop this presentation and I'm actually going to switch over to um, 
introduce you to Franklin. So Franklin, Franklin Assay, can you unmute yourself now? Franklin. Hello. Hey, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. So Franklin Assay is from the Ho Institute of Technology. Uh, so Franklin, welcome to Bankless Africa. And uh, But before I start, I just want to thank um, Bankless Dow, Bankless Africa, and in particular, Ernest, for giving us this forum for this presentation. And now what I want to do, is, or, or Franklin, maybe what you can do, welcome to Bankless Africa. Can you just introduce yourself? Yeah, I mean. yeah, we can hear you now. Can you introduce yourself? I am Franklin Aseye, a native of Avatime and a lecturer at Ho Technical University. Okay. Can you just give us a brief overview of the primary, secondary, and tertiary education system in the Avatime area? Thank you. Please, there are uh, eight uh, primary schools, uh, two senior high schools, one vocational technical institute, and uh, one college of education for purposely training teachers in the Avatime area. Okay. And, and what is your role in the educational system? My specific role in the education system is to develop methodologies and techniques through applied research and transferring them to the workforce of Ghana at the tertiary level. Okay. And do you also lecture at the Ho Institute of Technology? Yes, please. So the lecturing component is the transferring of methodologies and technologies that we have developed through applied research to the students. So the skills transfer is one role and the research through applied uh, and the methodologies and the um, technologies that we develop through applied research is another component of my role at the tertiary end of the educational system. Okay. And so does everyone who, does everyone have access to education who actually wants access to education in, in the area? No. There are financial access impediments, acute financial access impediments in our team area, generally. Okay, and, and then how does that manifest itself? Does that prevent people from going to educational systems? Do they start and then have to drop out? How, how does the financial impediment actually manifest itself? That financial impediment usually results in high attrition rates, especially at the tertiary level. And people sometimes often have to leave the classroom, even at the primary level, to go and work in order to support their parents to help them. So the financial issue, as I've stated already, is an acute one, which is actually blocking access. And people drop out. Actually, the dropout rate is quite high in my area. Okay. And, and then what are, what are the, so for the people who do have enough money to complete these programs, what are their job prospects at the end of the program once they graduate? Okay, like I stated, the orientation of our institute is basically technical and vocational training. So they go into agro processing, food processing. Some also do some little bit of mechanical engineering. Some enter into material engineering. Some are also into generally fabrication. So basically, this is what my the products of my institute usually go in for after graduation. Okay. And then um, what by the way, what is the location of, of your institute? And then and then what is the actual focus, the educational focus of the institute? The the educational focus of the institute is basically science and technology. It has science and technology orientation, and it is located in West Africa, Ghana, and a region called Volta region, but specifically, the city is called Ho, 
the capital of that uh, region in, in Ghana. Okay. And, and what challenges do you see in the educational system today? Okay, generally the educational system has a, a weak capacity in terms of the human resource, in terms of structures, in terms of data, and all this has to do with the government of the Republic not able to fund these things adequately. So by weakness, weak capacity of the human resource, lecturers even don't have too much of access to data, and like I'm facing technology issues now, network is not all over my residence where I stay, I have to drive off to the headquarters of Vodafone before I can even talk to you now. So technology, low investment in terms of structures, our structures are not uh, well organized. So it, it results in low output as well. So basically this has to do with finance generally, but in terms of the organization that I work for at the tertiary level of the educational system, human resource capacity is low, technology investment, low data, low structures, not well uh, organized, basically. Okay, and that kind of touches on to my next question because it is a technical institute. Um, do you cover any of these new blockchain type innovations like cryptocurrencies, decentralized autonomous organizations, stable coins, de decentralized finance? Do you touch on any of these topics at all? So this is new to me, this concept, even though as a, a, a researcher and a teacher, I am open to new ideas. This is very new to me. So I'm eager to even learn more about what you are mentioning, cryptocurrency, blockchain. In fact, it is this project that I'm hearing these things for the first time, not even in the literature that I've been uh, reviewing, please. Okay. So my next question is, you've pointed out some of the challenges, impediments, limitations in the local educational system. What do you believe is necessary to improve access to education in general, to you know, education about these crypto technologies and innovations that our, um, our audience are experts in? What, what do you think is necessary to improve access to this information? We, 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 most of the people here, like I indicated, you are self-funded. So we need scholarship. I mean, funding for education for these people. So if they introduce new cryptocurrencies and blockchain type of education, and there are people to fund it, I think it, it, it is a, a sine qua non, it's a requirement that will help all of us. So basically, like I indicated, if you trace the weaknesses in capacity, it has to do with the fin weak financial base, base of the government of the Republic of Ghana, and even the private people too. And you know, Africa, the population explosion is not allowing us to save capital. So basically, in short, what is necessary now is funding or scholarship to help people study. People are brilliant. They have fertile minds, minds to study, but the, the, the financial base to support is why a lot of our brilliant chaps are at home, burning other things. Okay. And you kind of touched on my next question a, a little bit, but maybe you can elaborate. So tell us something about the Abatime community and tell us something about the, the student body at the Ho Technical Institute. Oh, my native people oh, are very friendly people, hospitable people, and uh, eager to mix with people from different cultures and learn from them. And our area is a mountainous area. And because of that, we receive a little bit of uh, foreigners who come to Ghana for, for tourism. So we have good rapport with them. With regard to my students, they are, they are eager to learn new ideas. We are eager to learn. So these ideas of cryptocurrencies and blockchain, when I mentioned these things in the lecture room the other time, the students were happy whether these people are coming to the school to collaborate. And I told them, no, this is as just as the discussion says. So if they, these things work well and they come, I will route it to the vice chancellor and we will introduce that at the institute so that they can study about uh, the environment in our area. So my people are eager to learn any new idea and are ready to work with different from people from different cultural backgrounds, America, Europe, Australia, wherever. We are ready. Yeah, and one of the remits of, of Bankless Africa is actually to help with the education 
of DAOs and crypto and, and blockchain, um, DeFi, et cetera, um, throughout the whole of Africa. And so um, we actually have a representative who's based in Accra. And so hopefully there'd be a way to, um, to collaborate with you. Okay, so okay. one more question that I do have here is, can you tell us something about the Abatime Forest? Well, the Abatime Forest is a very mature forest. It is a thick one, tall, but layered. A relatively undegraded and it's suitable for this kind of crypto things that you are mentioning, blockchain crypto, so that we can understand carbon sequestration. Because in basic science, we were taught how trees give off oxygen and they absorb carbon that we introduce in the environment. So if we can get people to come and invest in this kind of project so that we can actually illustrate what we have been telling people at uh, the secondary level of the educational system, it will be interesting, please. Okay. And so um, final point, is there anything else that you would like to share with our audience today? Oh, the audience, if, if they can help with this kind of new project that has related to the environment, because there's a saying that the day the last tree dies, the last man also dies. In Africa, we have, we have been taught this uh, proverb long ago. So if they can come and collaborate with us so that we can protect and even preserve this forest relatively untouched or undisturbed, mature forest in Avatime area, I uh, will be happy. So we'll be looking forward to any collaboration if there can be any. Okay, so I really appreciate your time. I just want to find out, um, Ernest, do you have any, any questions or comments? No, I'm good. This is great. Uh, thank you so much, Franklin, for, for being here. Thank you, sir. Okay, so again, I'd just like to, fr to thank Franklin and everybody else who has called in today. And again, the focus was on the formal education system in the Abatime area. Um, again, with carbon collectible NFTs, um, we're planning to sell a number of NFTs that wrap around carbon sequestration. And um, the main beneficiary of this will be the Abatime forestry community. Um, there's an excellent mature um, forest there. Um, and we're actually following a program that's very different to any other program um, that's been executed as far as we're aware. Um, each NFT will link to one hectare of forestry. And um, that conveys carbon sequestration rights to um, into, the, into the future, for a number of years into the future. Again, it doesn't include any physical rights to the trees or the land. Um, and again, we, we think that's fairly unique. And we, we've spoken with a number of organizations so far, and they like what we're doing. And we're trying to speak with them now about different ways to collaborate. Next week, we're going to have another interview. The focus of that interview will be um, more to do with community education. And so how to take care of the forest. Um, what are some better practices for um, farming, especially small scale farming? And so it's going to be more um, to do with community education rather than the formal educational system. So again, I'd like to thank everybody for calling in and we will speak to you again next week. Thank you so much. Goodbye.